Go ahead. on Tuesdays at 6, we're working on our cantata. Uh, youth group is 2 to 4 p.m. the first Sunday of each month. They had their Christmas party yesterday. Bible study is at 6.30. We're doing an Advent um, Bible study. You're welcome to join us. There's a couple people from Cannonsburg that come. This Thursday evening is our secret sister dinner. Um, bring your secret sister present to reveal who you are to them. Bring a covered dish. And um, we'll have a ham, hopefully, because <laughs> Dory's supposed to do it. And uh, scalloped potatoes, <coughs> so you can fill in around that. Karen's doing green. 
Anybody that doesn't have a secret sister but would like to come anyway is welcome to join us. If you want, you can bring a present and we'll, we'll um, find other people that don't have secret sisters in exchange. We're collecting food items we want, would like to hand by today to benefit the Canberra Ministerium. Also, we're collecting scarves, hats, gloves, and gently used children's coats. There is a basket back there for that. And the um, items that we collect will go to Allison Elementary School. If you have a favorite Christmas hymn, give it to Jeff by um, the 19th. On the 26th, which is the day after Christmas and a Sunday, we're gonna have like a hymn sing. So give us your favorite hymn so that you can have a, an advanced morning of what you wanna sing. We're selling Rada Cutlery. There's a, a book, there are books back on the table if you wanna take orders um, or buy yourself. It makes nice Christmas presents. And we still have the cross and flame magnets and the church cookbooks and everything else that's on there. Do we have anything else, Jeff? Anybody? I just had a question. What, what day are you doing um, church right there? Sunday school? Yeah. The, night, the 19th. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, the 19th. The same day as the cantata and the cookie. The, the not, cookie, day. cookie day, yeah. Um, bring, your, bring a dozen cookies, then we'll share them afterwards. Okay? You girls have any announcements? Nope. Okay. Um, would you join me in the call for worship found in your bulletin? A messenger calls, prepare the way of the Holy One. Make a pathway for God straight into your heart. Blessed be the Holy One, who brings life into the deepest shadows. A prophet proclaims, make way in the desert for the coming of God to live in our midst. Blessed be the Holy One, who comes to live among us in peace. Are you ready for the coming day of God? Let us worship the One who calls us into light. Our first hymn is found in your hymn on page 220, Angels from the Realms of Glory. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord God of 
Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from a home, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And now if you would join me in the unison prayer found in your bulletin. Redeeming keeper of promises, your messengers remind us that you are the source of peace, justice, mercy, and loving kindness. As we prepare for your coming in your Son, Jesus, help us shine as the radiant body of Christ, that we may be light for a gloomy, broken world. Amen. Our first scripture today comes from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The coming messenger. See, I am sending a messenger to you. Prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the best descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to our Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old as, and as in former years.
And now we're going to light the Advent candle.
king. And what is a king? He's begins with an R. Royal, royalty, yes. So this celebrates Jesus' royalty as king. And this one, I have to please forgive me. My thumb messed it up. I smeared it a little bit. But what is this? Cup or... Okay, adults, help them out. Chalice. Chalice. Cup. Stuff. Which is correct, but a fancier name is chalice. And what's that represent? Very close. And also, what do we do on the first Sunday of the month? She's telling me everything what the word means. She's giving me the great definition of what um, we do when we uh, take the cup and the bread and we and it represents his body of blood. She's right. It's called communion. That's what we have on the first Sunday of every month is communion. And the chalice represents um, not only also continuing off the crown, his royalty, because royal kings and stuff drank out of fancy chalices. Um, but also that would remind us of communion and the sacrifice that God did for us. All right, and after service, you, um, I think someone will help you hang these on the tree. I'm gonna leave a few of my hooks behind. I need them for the next church. So I can't leave the whole box behind, but I'll, I'll figure out the hooks later. But <laughs> let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to have symbols that represent um, your son and what it means to have him as part of our life. Be with us as we continue on this path of Advent as we learn more about you and love you every day. In your holy name we pray. Amen. May I borrow somebody's bulletin? <laughs> Thank you, Hazel. Because I don't have one over there. All right, we are at the time of sharing our joys, our concerns, what the Lord's been doing in our lives this past week. Are there those that we need to lift up? Jen. Oh, Zach had his open heart surgery and everything went well, but he still needs to come for his recovery. Okay. Okay. Oh. Kurt still needs prayers. Kurt still needs prayer. Okay. Hazel. Everybody that's sick and thanksgiving for everybody that's getting better. Mm -hmm. We're not contagious anymore, but we're still happy. Yep, um, we need to pray for Victor and uh, Flora and Ed, because they all have it. And, well, Tammy's, Tammy's better, she's just stoned. Yeah, and, and Jody's recovering, hopefully, from a kidney stone, and he's doing fine. Okay. And Nori, and Nori, who we just sent to the hospital. Oh, what? <coughs> got a chest pain all of a sudden. Okay. Thank you. I did not know. I just thought she overdid yesterday and didn't come today. Okay. Marty, I saw your hand. Um, I have a talk to Ruth, so I don't really know anything, but I think she needs to continue in prayer. Okay. Karen. Lucy. Lucy. What's up with little Lucy? She, she runs fevers periodically. She wasn't able to be at the youth party yesterday, but her present uh, showed up. So we made sure that we had, a, we said the whole was Lucy. And so, I know, but we sent her everything we possibly could home. So uh, hopefully she feels our love towards her uh, with uh, what arrived at the house for her. 
Any other prayer concerns? For the church decorations look really nice, and so I know that takes a lot of time and effort. They look really nice. Yeah, everything. Everything looks really good. I believe Dory did the angel table as well. Her angel. <laughs> okay, you know that. Um, I'm still learning. She collects angels, and she finally told us not to get her anymore because she had too many. <laughs> Okay. We didn't use that phone. Oh. I came down and helped her. We didn't use that phone. Okay. But um, it, it's good to know uh, what people like. And um, I'm enjoying learning it still. This may be my third Christmas with you, but last year we really didn't have Christmas. Uh, so I missed a year. So I'm still learning. But it's nice. Uh, any others this morning? Not seeing any, then let us go on to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to gather together and to share our joys and our concerns with one another. And now, Lord, we place them into your loving, caring arms, knowing that that is the best place we can put someone. And Lord, we lift up Zach, as he recovers from his heart surgery, we thank you that it went well. And now, Lord, we just ask that the recovery goes just as well, without any complications. And Lord, we pray for Kurt as he recovers uh, from his injury and from Ruth from her treatments, that they are going well. And Lord, we pray for Jody as she recovers from kidney stones. And Lord, Lucy with her um, fevers and headaches, Lord, just be with her and help her to start feeling better. And Lord, with Dory, whatever is going on, Lord, we place her into your hands and we ask that all the doctors at the emergency room and the nurses that are taking care of her right now just guide and direct them Lord and Lord we pray for all those who either have COVID recovering from COVID or this respiratory infection that is going around and even the common cold that seems to be just a tad worse this year Lord we ask for healing for all of them and Lord, we also ask that you be with the Crawford family as they mourn the loss of Bob. Be with them, give them strength and courage through these difficult days. And we pray all this, praying the prayer that your son taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you churn in your hymnals to number 732, <clears throat> for come we that love the Lord.
scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, when um, Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler over Galilee, and his brother Philip ruled over the region of Iteria and Tecumenatus, and Lysaria and Albin. During the high priesthood of Annas and Cathias, the world of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it was written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And if you turn in the back of your hymnal to number 881, we prepare to affirm our beliefs by using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to gather together and not fear. And Lord, we thank you that we are able to gather, to be able to read your word, hear your word, and live it. And now, Lord, we pray for words that have been prepared, that through them or in spite of them, your will will be made known. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Last week, we embarked on the journey of Advent. We lit the first candle, and we read biblical passages that <coughs> propelled us into the future to consider the end of time, the apocalypse. Today, our reading sends us into the opposite direction. On the second Sunday of Advent, we are pulled into the distant past to hear the words of an ancient prophet, Malachi. Malachi tells of a figure who is coming to prepare the way for the Lord. He speaks of a messenger who will purify people's hearts. God is sending an emissary, writes Malachi, who comes intending to cleanse your souls. It all seems a bit presumptuous, doesn't it? In the midst of our preparing pre-Christmas hustle and bustle, the church trots out some primitive prophet who promises us an Advent scrub down. Is that really what we need right now? You would think that the lectionary would come up with a few encouraging words at this time, assuring us that we'll make it through another Christmas, instead of cheekily suggesting that before God arrives, we need a bath. In Flannery O'Connor's short story, Revelation, the main character, Mrs. Ruby Turpin, is the domineering spouse of a pig farmer. She is also an appalling racist. She categorizes everybody, black and white, rich and poor, thin and fat, according to an elaborate scale of bigotry that she is constantly adjusting. Worst of all, 
ruby actually views her fondness for making distinctions based on race or class to be a great virtue then one day she's sitting in the waiting room of her doctor's office expressing gratitude that she is neither black nor poor miss turpin is assaulted by a young girl who hurts her smack in the middle of the forehead with a book appropriately entitled Human Development, and who calls her a warthog from hell. This accusation overturns Mrs. Turpentine's world. For Ruby understands this attack not to be as simply the deranged act of an overstressed teenager. Rather, she understands this assault to be a message sent by God. Is Mrs. Turpentine right? Does God approach us with a whack up to side the head and call us nasty names? Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Asked the prophet Malachi. For he is like a refiner, a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Both of these images are a little frightening. A refiner's fire is the forced air, white hot blaze that melts metallic ores and brings their impurities to the surface. Fuller's soap is the strong lye-based soap used to bleach impurities out of cloth. Fire and soap, says Malachi. <coughs> Now, I'll be the first to admit that neither of these things seems especially Christmassy. And yet, we are told that the messenger who comes to prepare us for the Lord arrives with flames in one hand and a caustic detergent in the other. He comes to boil off the impurities of our souls and to apply a coarse scrub brush to our spirits. Carrier and eyes, Malachi is not. Why then have the churches picked the next text for our hearing on this day? Why this concern for purification as we head towards Christmas? On a hygienic level, we all understand the need to be clean. At dinner time, my grandmother Ruth was famous for sending people into the washroom with the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. And a friend with a newborn reported to me that the phrase she often utters to her other children these days is, is you need to wash your hands before you hold the new baby. Dutifully, we make regular trips to the sink to wash the grimes and germs off our hands. We know that physical cleanliness is important to our communal health, for our society's well-being, yet today's text prods us to take this thought a bit further, suggesting that this wisdom holds true on a spiritual level. I wonder if there is a sense in which we need a regular purification for our souls. Do our souls need a shower before Christmas? Perhaps as we make our way to Bethlehem in the manger this December, the prophet Malachi is simply reminding us that we need to wash before we hold the baby. When Ruby Turpentine arrives home from the doctor's office with a bruise on her forehead, she stomps out to the shed, picks up a hose, and begins washing down her pigs with a forceful stream of cold water. She is angry, angry at God. What right does he have to suggest that she, an upstanding citizen, is a warthog from hell? As soon as her husband is out of earshot, Ruby looks to the heavens and growls, why did you send me a message like that for? Here, am I a hog and me both? How am I saved and from hell too? she asks. How am I saved and I'm from hell as well? 
It is, I think, one of the most profound theological questions ever proposed in an American literature. It is also a question that we know quite well from this time of the year. How can I spend hours trying to make a good Christmas for my children and then lose patience with them in an, in an instant? How can I be out shopping for my beloved in one moment and then putting them down the next? How can I hum Christmas carols at the same time and wish people that would stop droning about the needy? How can I be saved and from hell? This question testifies to a classic theological formula. God both loves us and judges us. Or perhaps more accurately, because God loves us, he judges us. That is the deep truth that lies at the heart of the Malachi's prophecy. Our gracious God so loved us that God's great desire is to see us free from the grime that covers our souls. God is not saying, I refuse to let you come in for a visit unless you clean up a bit. No, God is used to having our messy selves around. Instead, God is saying, I'm going to help you clean up. I will assist you to throw off the tarnish that prohibits you from truly experiencing the joy that awaits this season. A whole subgenre of movies has arisen in recent years, which portrays a family's making an awkward way through yet another holiday. Sometimes it's Thanksgiving, but more often it's Christmas. Frequently, a boyfriend or girlfriend comes home or is brought home for the holiday for the very first time. In nearly every one of these movies, the pressure of the holiday gathering opens old family wounds. Now you would think that we would run from other people's holiday stress, but we don't. These movies are quite successful. And perhaps there's something cathartic in watching somebody else have a dysfunctional holiday. Perhaps these films remind us that we all carry things into the Christmas season that are less than holy. We approach our family gatherings and company parties burdened with old grudges, hurt feelings, and misunderstandings that we simply cannot let go of. In fact, instead of coming clean, we have secretly nurtured these wounds for a whole year, allowing them to cost our souls with no wonder God breaks out the fire in the soap. In my high school, ninth grade students were all required to take a basic writing composition class. There were two teachers who taught this class, <coughs> Mrs. Cole and Dr. Smith. You had no choice in selecting the instructor. They split you alphabetically. But everyone wanted to get Mrs. Cole. It wasn't that the stories about Mrs. Cole were so good. It was just the tales about Dr. Smith were that horrible. Smith assigned more detentions than any other teacher. Smith required that you typed your paper. And yes, this will date me because this is before computers. So you had to use an old-fashioned typewriter, and if you made one mistake, well, those of you know what that means. You had to start back at the beginning. Not, not this backspace or delete that we now so wonderfully have. And there never was enough light out to make sure that it wasn't, <laughs> that you couldn't see our mistake. So rip out the paper and put it back in. Start all over again. Smith made you memorize seemingly ir irrelevant words. And Dr. Smith used a medium point red felt tip pen to circle every grammatical error, every misspelling, 
and every flawed metaphor in your meager paragraphs. <clears throat> Dr. Smith was rigid. He was uncompromising. Writing for Dr. Smith was a painful experience. Being in Dr. Smith's class was high school terror. Except for the fact by the end of the semester, what we were producing, while far from brilliant, was recognizable English prose. Why does God promise to judge us? Is it out of some deranged desire to see us dangle over flames? No, quite the contrary. God judges us to save us. God seeks to purge our souls of every gunk and gross stuff so that we may have life and a life abundant life. At the close of Flannery O'Connor's story, Mrs. Turpin has a vision, a revelation. As she stands outside by her pigs, she sees a ladder on which people are ascending to heaven walking together in the groups that she has placed them. She and those like her are bringing up the rear of the procession. They are the last, following all those whom have despised, whom she has despised for so long. And O'Connor writes, they alone were on key, yet she could see by their shock and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. Sometimes the things that we need purged from our spirits are precisely the aspects of our personality that we are most proud of. Even those pieces of us that we consider to be our strengths and our virtues are at risk when the purifier of souls comes to town. This is the promise of the season, the gift of Malachi is to picture for us a God who lays out fire and soap this Advent, a God who wants to cleanse us from everything that would prevent us from standing in awe at the manger. Why does God do this? Well, one clue might come from O'Connor's story. The name of the girl who throws her book at Ru Ruby Turpine in the doctor's office, her name is Grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, who approaches us with fire and soap this Advent, sear away our old grudges, our hurt hearts, and heal us. Soap away the hardness in our hearts and wash clean even those attitudes that we think are virtuous. If they stand in the way of us approaching the manger, give us clean hands to hold the baby. In your holy name we pray. Amen.